Okay, in this section we're going to talk about uh, the structures and functions of hair. So hair itself is actually made of dead keratinized cells. And you don't find hair on the palm, soles, lips, nipples, or portions of the external genitalia. But everywhere else you do find hair. Um, and some of the functions of hair include, uh, you know, sort of sensation of objects on your skin like insects. Uh, hair on the head guards against physical trauma. Hair also protects from heat loss and shield the skin from sunlight exposure. So you'd find that those areas of your body that are hairy are less likely to get burned by, uh, you know, sunburn. Now, uh, in terms of the structure of a hair, uh, we call these pili. And they're basically flexible strands of dead keratinized cells. In fact, the hair itself is, a, is structured very similarly to the stratum corneum of your skin in the sense that it's a thick layer of dead keratinized cells. However, in this example, hair is actually more of in a tubular shape rather than being flat and superficial. Now, it's produced by hair follicles, which are essentially um, you know, keratinocytes in the structure of stratified squamous epithelium. And uh, this contains hard keratin. It's not like soft keratin they find in the skin. Hard keratin is tougher and more durable. And these cells don't flake away, so that hairs typically stay as one solid band. Now, in terms of regions of a hair, we have the shaft versus the root. The shaft is the area that extends above the scalp or just extends above skin. And this is where keratinization is complete. The root is the area within the skin, or scalp here, and uh, this is where keratinization is still occurring. Now, the three parts of a hair shaft include the medulla, cortex, and cuticle. Medulla means marrow, and this, so this is the central core of large cells and air spaces. The cortex is several layers of flattened cells that surround the medulla, and the cuticle is the outer layer that consists of overlapping layers of, of single cells. Now, hair pigments are made by melanocytes within the hair follicle itself. Now, it turns out different combinations of melanins, like there's yellow, rust, brown, or black melanins, these are what create the different hair colors. It turns out that red hair has an additional type of pigment called pheomelanin, and gray or white hair results from melanin production that decreases, and instead you get air bubbles that fill melanin within the shaft instead of melanin itself. Now, just looking at a cross-section of hair, at the level of the root, what we find is that uh, this is the follicle itself. So the follicle has a peripheral connective tissue sheath, and that's a, what attaches the actual epithelial layer here, which is um, you know this epithelial root sheath. Now it turns out that these cells divide and push inward, just like epithelium does in your skin. In fact, as these cells div divide and push inward, they start to approach the hair itself. And what we find is that by the time those cells make it to the hair, they're essentially dead cells that are full of keratin. And the hair shaft itself, or sorry, the root, it's actually made of uh, cuticle, cortex, and medulla. The cuticle is sort of the outermost layer, cortex is the, you know, this out layer here, and the medulla is the, the deeper central layer that can contain some air bubbles. And this is what makes up your hair itself. Now, um, these uh, hair follicles extend from the epidermal surface to the dermis, and essentially we got the bulb, which is an expanded area deep in the follicle. The hair follicle receptors, also called root hair plexus, have sensory nerve endings that wrap around the bulb, and this is actually considered a sensory touch receptors because if, if your hair bends, it's going to activate this hair follicle receptor. Now the wall of the follicle itself is made of a peripheral connective tissue sheath, which is what we saw. It's made from dermis, also called a fiber sheath. And there's a glassy membrane, which is basically a basal lamina. And then we have the epithelial root sheath, which is uh, derived from epidermis because it's made of stratified squamous epithelium. Now, the hair matrix is the actively dividing area of the bulb that produces new hair cells. And as these cells divide, they start to push upward and incorporate into the growing hair. Now, as the matrix makes new cells, it pushes older ones upward. And um, it turns out that our hair follicle also has an erector pili muscle attached, which is basically a smooth muscle that's involved with goosebumps. Now, the hair papilla is an extension of dermal tissue into the uh, bulb of the hair itself. And this actually supplies nutrients to the growing hair and specifically supplies nutrients to the hair matrix. So just looking at this structure here, this is actually a longitudinal section of the hair itself. You can see, remember, our connective tissue sheath 
on the outside. We have our epithelial root sheath here, and then we have our hair itself with our medulla and the cortex. Now, this expanded tip here is called the bulb. And this protrusion of dermis into the bulb is called the papilla, which contains lots of blood vessels and nerve endings. And this is ultimately what supplies nutrients to the matrix, which is here. And this is ultimately the place where cells divide to grow into the extending hair itself. And it makes sense that your, that your nutrient supply would be close to the cells that divide a lot. You can find some melanocytes nearby because these are the ones that basically incorporate melanin into the growing hair. And that's ultimately what gives hair different color. And in the absence of melanin, hair is going to be kind of grayish or white because of air bubbles rather than melanin itself. Now, there's different types of hair. Vellus hair is pale, fine body hair you find in children and adult females. Think of this as like peach fuzz. Terminal hair is the coarse long hair. You find this on sky, the scalp, eyebrows, and it grows at puberty. Um, so you find this in the axillary and pubic regions in both sexes, also in the face and neck of males. Now, nutrition and hormones do affect hair growth. So if individuals are having abnormalities in hair growth, this could reflect you know, uh, hormonal or nutrient uh, disturbances. And uh, follicle cycles between active and regressive phases, and uh, you lose about 90 scalp hairs a day, and hair grows about 2.25 millimeters per week. Now, alopecia is a term we use to describe for hair thinning in both sexes after age 40. So alopecia is just an age-related loss of hair. But this differs from true or frank baldness because this is genetically determined and sex-linked. Now, uh, this is what's associated with male pattern baldness because this is actually caused by a follicular response to a hormone called dihydrotestosterone or DHT. And dihydrotestosterone is a more potent form of testosterone, but this actually causes hair to not grow as quickly, which can lead to male pattern baldness. Now, hair thinning can be induced by several different factors. Uh, for one, if you have really high fever, that can lead to hair, the thinning of hair. Uh, surgery, emotional trauma can also lead to thinning of hair. Um, certain drugs like antidepressants and blood thinners or steroids, chemotherapeutic drugs, all these can lead to hair thinning. Uh, protein deficient diets. Um, and uh, there's other diseases like alopecia areata, which is actually an autoimmune disease where your immune system attacks the follicles. Some hair loss is reversible. But others, like from burns or radiation, because it leads to scar tissue and permanent injury of the cells, these uh, are permanent. And so the hair, unfortunately, can't be recovered.